Good evening, Brian, and welcome along to the Lodge Hope of Karachi number 337 and our lockdown lecture series. Uh, first of all, can I wish each and every one of you and your families a very prosperous new year and fingers crossed, everything crossed, that we can get back to some sort of Masonic normality as soon as possible, Brian. Uh, but as I've said before, we will continue our weekly lecture series until that happens to allow us to have at least some Masonic uh, connections with each other. As ever, Brian, can I remind you, please, of the Grand Lodge of Scotland guidelines in terms of Zoom uh, technology. Please keep your camera running, a recognisable name in the little square box in front of me. Uh, if you do have any broadband or bandwidth challenges, just drop me a message in the chat box. Thank you so much. Uh, can I also remind you, please, and ask you, please uh, sign our virtual tile on our Facebook pages. That is very much appreciated. Oh, <coughs> Brian, uh, as you all by now are very much aware, our guest lecturer this evening is Brother David Brown. Uh, we now have him on a single camera uh, and it's working and it's a, a great pleasure to, to have him here. David's been a great supporter of the lockdown lecture series from pretty much the beginning and it's a, a great personal pleasure for me to to welcome him along here this evening. Uh, and with that, David, I, I now hand over the virtual floor to you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Gordon. Uh, I'll just check, do I have screen sharing? You should be able to screen share, yeah. I have host disabled participant screen sharing. You should be able to now. Right, that's us. Right. Can everyone see that screen? That's it there now, David, yeah. Good. Very good, very good. Right, well, for those of you who don't know me, I, I'm David Brown. I'm the Master of Lodge Sterling Royal Arts number 76, and I'm also a past master of the Athol Lodge number 384 in Chucky Tillish. Uh, it's a great honour and a great pleasure for me to be taking part this evening, uh, giving the lecture rather than listening to it. And I can only hope that it reaches the standard that uh, we have become used to in the Hope of Karachi, where the, the, the lectures are just, out, uh, frankly, outstandingly good and something that I, I'm sure we all look forward to every week. So I very much hope that I don't let you down on this. Uh, this is a lecture that I, I prepared originally for the Masters and Past Masters Association in Dumbartonshire to mark the 50th anniversary of the Long Hope lifeboat disaster of the 17th of March, 1969. So we are going to have a look, first of all, at the circumstances of that disaster, and then at how it was, has been commemorated by the Brethren of Lodge and Cole, number 1022 in Orkney. We start off here at Osmond Wall Cemetery at Kirk Hope, on the island of South Walls in Orkney. And this is the memorial to the eight-man crew of the Long Hope lifeboat who lost their lives in the Pentland Firth on that fateful day of the 17th of March, 1969. You will see that at the bottom of the memorial, it says, greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his fellow men. And as you will see, this describes exactly the circumstances of the Long Hope lifeboat disaster. Of the eight crew, four were members of Lodge St. Colm, number 1022, in, in South Walls, and one was a member of Lodge Kirk Oakle, winning number 382. And uh, among the other three who were lost were two of their sons. This was the Long Hope lifeboat in 1969. And these are seven of the eight uh, crew members who perished. Uh, and you can see their names there. Uh, Brother Daniel Kirkpatrick, uh, Lodge 1022, was the, was the, was the coxswain. Uh, Brother James Johnston was the master, was the reigning master. Uh, Brother Robert Johnson was also a member of 1022. Brother James Swanson was a member of Lodge Kirk Oakle winning 38-2. Looking down the list of names, you will see the preponderance of the names Kirkpatrick and Johnston. And uh, it will be no surprise to you that these were all, they were all related. And you can imagine the, the hole that this made in, the, in those families. 
uh, in, a, in the course of a single night. These are more of the details of the, the, the brethren and, and uh, others who lost their lives. And I'll just give you a minute just to run down through these names and look, look at some of these details rather than reading them out to you. Right down at the bottom, you'll see the name of uh, Eric S. McFadgen. Uh, he actually shouldn't have been on the boat. He, turned, uh, he was not rushed up, uh, to be uh, uh, to go out that night, but, he but when the call went out, he turned up anyway, and the cops decided to take him. Longford lifeboat operated in the Pentland Firth. Now, this is one of the roughest sections of water around the British coastline, and in fact, one of the rougher uh, courses of, wa of water in the world. Uh, I've come through it several times. I've been through it when it's been a, like an absolute mill pond, and I've I, I've been across it when uh, there's been a considerable gale blowing. So I've seen it in all I've seen it in all conditions. Uh, what's particularly distinctive about it is that there's a tidal race that runs from west to east. Uh, that that in a spring tide can reach the speed of eight of nine of, of about nine knots. Uh, if you have a if you have a storm in the North Sea then that will often be in a southeasterly. It will be the, the wind, the wind and the waves will be coming in a westerly direction. So the two will meet in the Pentland. You have contrary forces coming from the Atlantic Ocean and the North Sea, which makes it an extremely, or can make it an extremely turbulent city, stretch of water. Here's the Pentland Firth in a little bit more detail. Uh, the lifeboat station at the time of the disaster was at Brims, on the south end of the island of Hoy, you can see it just here. Across here, the island of South Walls, it's actually joined by a causeway. You can see the causeway there. And the, the new lifeboat station that was created in 2001 is, is actually here. And we'll be having a look at that later on. But at the time of the disaster, the Long Hope lifeboat was based here at Brims. This is the the, the lifeboat. Uh, she was built in 1962 in Cowes. Uh, she was a Watson class lifeboat, a 47 footer. Uh, she'd been on the station since April uh, 1962, so she'd been there for seven years. Uh, she was 28 tons, so she was quite light, uh, a maximum speed of 9.2 knots. She'd been launched on 34 occasions and saved 24 lives. She was named. Uh, our NLI boats are named after the donors or the principal donors uh, of each uh, for the cost of each boat. Uh, this one was an anonymous donor who wished to be known only by his initials, and that is why she was named TGB. This is uh, Daniel Kirkpatrick in 1954. Uh, 15 years before the disaster. And this was this is actually the best picture we've been able to find of him. It shows him a bit younger, but this was the date in which he took command of the Long Hope lifeboat. Now, lifeboatmen, if they form, if they carry out particular acts of courage, can be awarded, uh, can receive awards of various kinds. There are medals, there are illuminated addresses, there are, there are sums of money that can be given. And most lifeboatmen will go through their entire careers and would never be in a situation where they have to, where they are qualified for, for an award such as this. These are the awards that uh, Daniel Kirkpatrick had, had been given in the course of the 15 years he had been spent with the Long Hope Lifeboat. 1959, silver medal for the rescue of the true of a, collar, of a trawler. 1960, thanks from the RNLA, RNLI inscribed in vellum for the re a rescue from another trawler. 1960, a gift from the James Michael Bauer Endowment Fund. Now, these are not given lightly. Uh, and these are for lifeboatmen who have been awarded a gold or a silver medal and have performed particular acts of gallantry or acts of courage. 
1964, an, another clasp for his silver medal for the, the rescue of the crew of another trawler. Uh, this was a breeches boy rescue. This is quite a hazardous kind of rescue to carry out. It involves uh, uh, putting a line across to the other vessel and to get a bosun's chair uh, across between the, uh, the two of them. So quite, uh, quite a hazardous operation, particularly if it's a small boat as TSA, TGB. That was a further gift from the James Michael Bower Endowment Fund. 1968, another class, a third class, onto his, uh, onto his medal. He awarded for the rescue of uh, men from another trawler. And in 1968, the Maud Smith Award for the bravest act of life saving in 1968, and a further gift from the Michael Bauer Endowment Fund. Now, you might say that uh, Daniel Kirkpatrick was quite fortunate uh, to be based in Long Hope because uh, the, the, the sheer uh, tempestuous seas of the Pentland Firth gave opportunities for very, very daring rescues. But nevertheless, he and his crew had the courage to carry these rescues out fully recognised as such by the RNLI. And as a touch of irony, the week after the disaster, uh, uh, Daniel Kirkpatrick was actually due to travel to London to receive those last two awards. At 8 p.m. on the 17th of March, a Mayday call was received by the Coast Guard Service by, from the captain of the Liberian registered General a Freighter a, a Irene. She was a 2,300 ton steamer. She was drifting without power and out of control in a southeasterly gale of at least force nine. This gale had already been blowing for three days. There was poor visibility with flurries of snow. The captain of the Irene gave her position as 18 miles off South Ronaldson. She was actually three miles off South Ronaldson. They, they had become totally disorientated. This was the day before, the days before GPS and whatnot. They'd become totally disorientated. The force of the winds and the waves had driven them much further west, 12 miles further west than they thought. In fact, 15 miles further west than they thought they were. So the Coast Guard a headquarters a called out the TGB, they called out the RNLI, a, believing her to be 18 miles off South, South Ronaldson. But to their credit, they also made preparations to effect a, a breaches boy rescue should she be driven ashore in South Ronaldson. And that turned out to be great foresight. Now, at the same time, the, a, and that was the this is, the, this is the TGB being launched, and actually in this, in this particular photograph in daytime, but the launch at the eight o'clock in, in a February night would have been in total darkness. This would have been absolutely pitch black. She, would go, she went down the ramp. She wasn't the only lifeboat that was called out. Uh, the 70 foot uh, Grace Patterson Ritchie, uh, based in Kirkwall, uh, on the north side of the, the Orkney mainland was also called out. Uh, she was a much larger vessel. She was a 70 footer as against uh, the 47 foot TGB. She was 87 tons as opposed to TGB's 28 tons. So she was a much more substantial vessel. But uh, TGB was much closer to the anticipated position of the steamer Irene. So 840, TGB radioed in her position by VHF as three miles southeast of Cantit Head. That's approximately here. She's 40 minutes out. She's about five miles out of our, the, our launching position. She's a heading, a, she's going to head around the island of Swona, but that also means that once she comes round the east coast of Swona, she's going to run into this tidal race that's running from west to east. And on this particular evening, it's a, it, there's a, another tidal race running down the side of South Ronaldsey being driven by the, the, the waves of this Force 9 gale. And of course, there's the Force 9 gale out in the North Sea. So it is really exceptional conditions that the TGB is heading into. Seven, seven minutes past nine, she reports as, her position as being one mile east of Swona. Ironically, 
just eight minutes after this, at 9.15, Irene was driven, uh, driven aground at Grimness. So a TGB is still in the relatively sheltered waters uh, uh, of, of the southern reaches of Scapa Flow, but Irene, the ship that she's going to the aid of, is aground. That's Irene. That's her at Grimness. Uh, uh, driven, driven, as, driven ashore, beam on. Uh, she's been heavily battered by the gale, but she's remained upright. She hasn't broken up. Uh, she's got a crew of 17, and uh, these have now to, uh, to be got off. But the crew of TGB are totally unaware of this because of the time taken for messages to be passed from one place to another. So they are still proceeding to the rescue. At 9.28, they send their last message. And at 9.35, they're sighted by lighthouse keepers at the Pentland Skerries Lighthouse. This is the last that's ever seen of TGB. After this, it's complete silence. She's headed round the south tip of South Ronaldsey. She's gone into these contrary waves at 30 foot, exceptionally up to 60 foot, and uh, she's just been overwhelmed. This is a painting that was done uh, to show what, uh, what probably happened. It's likely that she pitched uh, up to a great height and then plummeted straight down into a deep hole, uh, either stunning the crew or creating such disarray that it would have been beyond human capacity, uh, capacity uh, to control her. Even the larger Grace Patterson Ritchie would probably have gone down under these circumstances. And there is actually a precedent. The, the, light, the Northern Lighthouse Board's uh, tender, the Pole Star, ran into one of these holes in similar conditions uh, off the Sumbara Roost, just to the south of Shetland, uh, several years earlier. She survived, but she was a large 1,300-ton uh, uh, ship. And the crew then said they just came through it. They came through it just and no more. A, a little 28 tonner like the TGB would have a, a, no chance at all. Meanwhile, back uh, with Irene, our 17 crew members are still aboard. The Coast Guard, uh, with great foresight, had prepared a breaches boy operation. Their team reach, uh, uh, rushes to Grimness. They launch the breaches boy. Uh, they get the first man ashore at quarter to one in the morning, and uh, at one, by 1.30, the Breaches Boy rescue of all 17 men has been affected. Uh, meanwhile, the Kirkwall lifeboat has arrived. The conditions are far, far too rough for her to do anything, so she then goes off in search of TGB. Uh, she has a difficult uh, voyage down the east coast of South Ronalds. Uh, um, reaches TGB's last known position but there's absolutely no sign of anything. She fires a parachute flare, there's no response, and there's absolutely uh, no sign. Nothing is seen of TGB until 1.40 p.m. on the following afternoon, where she's found capsized in this position here. She's been blown uh, this whole distance back uh, by, the, by the storm, and uh, she's upside down. She was not a self-writing lifeboat. All modern lifeboats are self-writing. She was not a self-writing lifeboat, which meant that once she'd capsized, that was it. She was she'd turned over and and and, uh, and that was it. She could not. She would not self-write. I'll I'll explain self-writing boats a bit later. Uh, she was towed into Scrabster Harbour, and uh, she was found to have suffered a serious a uh, hull damage. She was then turned upright, and it was that point that much to the, much to, but this very, very sad occasion in which the seven bodies were found, still in their position, still harnessed in, still strapped in. Uh, all were in the cabin except Dan Kirkpatrick, who was at the wheelhouse, he was still at the wheel and his neck was broken. And this, uh, this, uh, supported the theory that she pitched up to a great height and then down into the hole and a whiplash effect had just had just snapped his neck. Of one of the crewmen, uh, James Swanson, 
the member of Kirkwall Co winning, there was no trace. He was never, his body was never found. Uh, he was the assistant, uh, the assistant mechanic. There was an RNLI inquiry, and uh, the finding was, not surprisingly, that the TGB had been overcome by uh, high seas and, frankly, maelstrom conditions in the Pentland Park. And uh, that, was, uh, that was that. She was salvaged. She was taken down to the RNLI's research establishment, which at that time was in Ipswich. This is her being towed down, uh, to, uh, taken down. She was found not to be beyond repair. She was actually uh, uh, refurbished and put back into service. Uh, she was too valuable an asset for the RNLI to lose, frankly. Uh, she was put back into service. Uh, she was allocated to Aaron Moore in County Donegal. Uh, bear in mind the RNLI covers the whole of the whole of Ireland, including the Irish Republic. Uh, she was put into service again in Aaron Moore in County Donegal, uh, where she was in service for another 10 years. And then finally, in 1986, she was sold to the Scottish Maritime Museum. And there she sits to this day in Irvine. In, in pretty well in original condition. Meanwhile, back up in Orkney, uh, this magnificent memorial uh, was subscribed, was set up and unveiled by Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, uh, as you can see there on the 9th of August, 1970. Meanwhile, Irene, Irene stayed where she was, here she is in 1974. Uh, five years after the disaster, uh, having taken a battering from uh, the Orkney, Orkney Gales, uh, but large bits of it have simply disappeared. And in 2010, this is what was left. Just our boilers and engines and that's, and uh, various bits of scrap metal, and that's it. She was never salvaged. She wasn't ready to be worth salvaging. It was too difficult an operation. And, uh, the, she, she was too badly damaged, so uh, that really was the end of Irene. My wife and I visited Long Hope in June 2017, and here are some of the pictures that we took there. Uh, this uh, in the top left is the current Long Hope lifeboat, uh, Helen Comrie. Uh, she's a Tamar class uh, lifeboat, very modern self-writing lifeboat. She's been there since 2006. And uh, she isn't launched like the TGV was launched. She's kept afloat all the time so that she's ready just for the crew to, to, to jump aboard and go. Now, the fact that she's a Tamar class lifeboat is quite interesting because at Angle RNLI station in Milford Haven in Wales, there is a Tamar class uh, lifeboat called Mark Mason. Now, this vessel is not named after Mr. Mark Mason. It was actually donated by the Grand Lodge of Mark Master Masons of England. So there is a Masonic uh, lifeboat, and she's in Milford Haven. If you're ever down in Milford Haven, uh, have a look out for her. And uh, down in the bottom two pictures, we can see the crew accommodation in the new lifeboat station that opened in 2001. This is the old lifeboat station that TGB was launched from. And it's Long Hope Light Museum. And in that museum, there is a memorial for a, that was placed there by the Brethren of Lodge St. Cole, number 1022, uh, to the memory of all the members of the crew, Masons and non-Masons alike. There is also this a commemorative, a, a commemorative text with uh, Mark Penny from Lodge 1022 that uh, gives a tribute to the brethren who lost their lives. And this is an extract from what that says. These men went to sea in the lifeboat as volunteers, not for financial gain, not for glory, but because they simply had to do had to go. It was what Brims had always done and continues to do for mariners in distress on one of the worst stretches of water in the world, the Pentland Firth. The coxswain and his crew lived up to the obligations of true and steadfast masons and men. 
Through the tragedy comes a deep sense of pride to be associated with men of such stature and sense of duty to their fellows. And I'm sure we can all agree with these sentiments. These men belong to two brotherhoods. The brotherhood that we know, the brotherhood of Freemasons. They belong to another brotherhood, the brotherhood of the sea. There were, there were lives at risk at sea. It was their duty to go. It was their obligation. They would go. But I would suggest that the morals that drove these men were the morals that we celebrate and aim to instill in all our candidates in Freemasonry. The, the, the morals of mutual support and help and understanding with the realization that sometimes, sometimes this comes at a cost, but our duty to our brethren is paramount. And I would pick out the words, continues to do for mariners in distress, because the current coxswain of the Long Hope crew is none other than Kevin Kirkpatrick, the grandson of Daniel Kirkpatrick. Another one of the crew's members is his daughter, and his son is a member of the Kirkwall lifeboat crew. So that tradition has carried on, uh, irrespective of what may have, uh, have happened in the course of this disaster. They will go out again and again and again to rescue people at sea. And we end where we started with the figure of a lone lifeboat looking out over, over Long Hope towards Cantic Head Lighthouse. You can see that just in the right-hand side here. Looking for his brethren of the sea who will not return alive. But we can be sure that the Long Hope crew, including two members of the Kirkpatrick family, will be ready to put to sea whenever mariners are in danger in one of the world's most hazardous and unpredictable stretches of water. Thank you, Brennan. Good. Thank you so much for that amazing tribute to those brave men, brave masons and brave sailors. I think some of the words that struck out to me from your presentation was heroism bravery, selflessness, but importantly, that line that you said, but they had to go. And I think I would agree with you that those men of stature, those men of duty, were possibly inspired by the Masonic principles that we inspire to teach our candidates. And I would like to thank you for keeping their memory alive in the way that you've done very respectively, respectfully this evening. David, thank you on behalf of everyone here at the Lockdown Lecture Series. I know there's a couple of questions and some comments for you uh, in the chat. Let me just scroll to them. Uh, I'm doing the chat up, actually. I, I think we have uh, the Cox of the Fraserburgh lifeboat with us this evening. Ah, right, uh, of course. Brother Vic Sutherland. In that uh, case, I'll say just a couple of words about that. Uh, and, uh, the, the following year, 1970, was the third Fraserburgh lifeboat disaster of the 20th century. And that was another watching class boat. And uh, together, the Long Hope and Fraserburgh disasters were instrumental in causing the, 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 the RNLI to adopt a policy of 100% self-writing uh, all weather lifeboats. And I'm sure uh, the Cox will be able to add something to that. Thank uh, Douglas uh, invited him there. Yeah, Vic is there. I can see him now. So, uh, Vic, on behalf of us all, thank you, sir, for, for your dedication and your service to the seafaring community uh, around our shores. Uh, and if you do want to say anything at any point, just please uh, feel free to do so. Hi, right. oh, thank you very much for inviting me tonight. Um, I was late getting into the, to the meeting, but... Uh, a very well put together presentation here just now, and as mentioned, in the Brooks, we've seen the uh, three lifeboat disaster through our history with the loss of 13 men. So, 
with a very strong connection, obviously, with the, the Long Hope uh, crew. Um, can I'm still in touch with, well, my, my, I'm full-time coaching mechanic at the Brock Lifeboat here, and uh, I can I speak regularly with the two full-time lads at Long Hope as well, with mm -hmm. uh, Kevin and his full-time mechanic, Alex, so they have a, a good connection with the, with the Long Hope crew, so mm -hmm. it's uh, well, I really good to hear that tonight. Um, I was learning something new and kind of it just takes him just for the uh, <clears throat> bit life boatings are about. No, thank you, Vic. And it's a, a pleasure and an honor to have you here with us this evening. Uh, Danny Morrison comments, and I know Danny's from up that neck of the woods up further away. I uh, comments the most recent loss in the county first happened in January 2015. With the loss of all eight hands of MV Semford, very near to the TGB's capsize location. I uh, Colin Clark comments it looks like a little bit like the Carmack Ferry port in Port Glasgow. And I think I uh, wherever you go around our, our coastline, uh, you'll see similarities. David Bob, Bob Philip asks, did the lodge hold a lodge of sorrow? And did they provide benevolence to the young families who lost? whose husbands I, lost their lives. Right. I tried to, when I was doing the original election in 2019, I tried to find out about this. I know that uh, Lodge and Chrome 1022 had gone into abeyance. And I was trying to find out some more information or, uh, just, just of that nature. I wrote to the Secretary of Lodge, Kirk Pro Winning, and he came back to me to say that there was just one member of uh, St. Chrome uh, who was now a member of the... Uh, uh, of, of Kirk Rocco winning and he wanted nothing to do with it and he didn't want a, I got the impression I got was they didn't want strangers looking into a, looking into what they regard as, as their kind of private grief sort of thing and uh, it was a, he said it would uh, he wasn't really able to offer assistance because it might cause some uh, some discord at his uh, at his end so I said oh well fine thanks but yeah. that, I had been trying to find that out yeah, I, I suppose that that's totally understandable. It's uh, such a, a tragedy that was so close to home for them. Mm -hmm. uh, Ian McIntosh uh, thanks you for a, a nice presentation. And he goes on, a very sad loss of many Brown. Another lifeboat disaster was that of the Broughty Ferry lifeboat, Mona. She was also a Watson-class lifeboat. She also rolled over and could not write herself. The Mona was lost with all eight of her crew in December 1959. She was going out to help the light ship Aberté off the coast of Fife. Mm -hmm. One of the crew was George Watson, a member of Lodge Broughty Castle number 486, and his body was never found mm -hmm. either. There, Alan Maitland, such bravery. Alan Keegan, uh, to you, David, absolutely outstanding, David. Thank you for an uplifting and moving lecture. Uh, Denny Morrison again, living next to the Firth, the conditions then were pretty similar to today. Mm. And I think we've seen some of the weather reports and the, the, like going up and down and all over the place just now, just awful. Superb lecture, David, thank you. Excellent presentation, many thanks, David. Congratulations, David. Excellent lecture, well done. Michael Hearn, uh, one of our seafaring realm. This tribute reminds me of a similar lifeboat disaster here in the southeast at Rye with the Mary Stanford, which was lost in November 1928. Mm -hmm. Colin Clark asks, David, do you know what happened to the crew of the freighter? My experience in the Northern Isles is that they would have been taken into the homes of the islanders without question, similar to Gander in 9-11. Yes, that is indeed what happened. Mm -hmm. Ronnie Forbes asks, how is the Long Hope Museum maintained? Is it the RNLI? Uh, or locals? It's locals. It's the Long the Life the Long Hope Lifeboat Museum Trust, uh, of whom the chairman is none other than uh, Kevin Kirkpatrick. Uh, the in uh, 2019 in the Masters and Past Masters Association, we made a donation to the trust to uh, to, to mark the 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 50th anniversary of the of the disaster, and I got a very nice letter back from uh, Kevin Kirkpatrick. Uh, thank, uh, thanking us for that, but it's an entirely community run. It, it, basically, it's, ru it's run by the current lifeboatmen, and uh, past, uh, past, past and present. 
It's run by long hope lifeboatmen, past and present, mm -hmm. who are a part of the, muse the, the museum trust. The museum trust, like the RNLI itself, depends entirely on voluntary contributions. Okay. And no pressure at all, Brian, but I will put up the link to that later on this evening on the Facebook pages, and you can do whatever you wish to do. Uh, Ron Mann, excellent lecture, David. Uh, Alan Turton, David, beautifully delivered and very moving. Thank you so much. Danny Morrison, uh, well done, Brother Brown. The first certainly lives up to his other alias, Hell's Mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, David. I didn't see that very well as my eyes are brimful with tears, but I was hanging on every word. I am going off to have a good grief over such a tragic loss. Well, Ian, I think many of you were feeling, many of us were feeling the same as you are. Aubrey, uh, over in Chile, am I correct in assuming that Ari and Ally relies entirely upon voluntary contributions? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, Aubrey, totally. Uh, and I think you mentioned, David, that it's one of the organisations like the rugby that they uh, is both North and Southern Ireland uh, yes. that they encompass. So it is uh, yes. the, the, the full islands of these islands. Uh, Gordon, apologies, I was late in, but managed to catch it the last 10 minutes of David's lecture, which was brilliant uh, from David Stewart. Tom Edgar, thank you very much for this very interesting story. The perfect storm indeed. We will never be able to thank these brave men and women who tackle these horrendous storms to save another life without thinking of their own. And that's the master of another seaside uh, lodge, uh, Fisher Row in Musselburgh, which interestingly was on the TV the other day, Brian, uh, with Michael Portillo uh, meeting old Fisher woman as he was looking at the railways coming out of Haddington into Edinburgh, which no longer exist. Uh, William Shand, uh, excellent presentation. I remember it well, been on the news at the time. Also brought back memories of the Fraserburgh disaster. Thanks, Brother David, for a heartfelt presentation. Slider, the new grandpa. I used to be proxy master at uh, 382, and I've been over to Kirkwall several times. Well done with this sad talk. Alec Cray, what an outstanding tribute to the bravery of these men and women who put their lives at risk to save others every time they launch. Thanks for an outstanding lecture, Brother David. Uh, Dr. Douglas Nicol, uh, superb lecture. Well done. I have often experienced flights from Orkney to Aberdeen in the Gale. That was bad enough, but spending hours in a boat must be horrendous. Colin Thompson, a very poignant and interesting lecture. And David, I'm going to continue reading these because I think they pay tribute to those that you are paying tribute to. Thank you, David. Excellent lecture and very fitting tribute to brave men and masons. Apologies for being, Nobby has joined us. Welcome, Nobby. Uh, apologies for being late, but we'll watch online. But what I saw was excellent. Thanks, David. Well researched. Colin, another question for you, David. Sometimes these disasters cause changes in regulations and laws. Was anything learned from this? Yes. Uh, the main issue was about uh, self, self uprighting uh, lifeboats. The, the Long Hope and Fraserborough together convinced the RNLI that, they, that this was what they had, the, the route they had to go down. Uh, this, the self-uprighting self lifeboat, I'll give you an, I might give you an example here. Right, this, is a, this is a seven class lifeboat, right? Can you see that? Uh, what will happen is that the, all the heavy items, the heaviest items are placed down uh, below the as, as all, all well below, below the water line, so your maximum weight is at the bottom. The wheelhouse here is uh, is basically filled with air, and when if she goes if she goes on her beam end or even, or even a full cap size, because uh, all the openings will automatically close. There's a kind of pendulum mechanism that detects the angle at which the boat is lying. And uh, if it exceeds a certain angle, every, every uh, opening uh, will close. So that when she goes over, all the weight is here and she'll self right Now, there's a great piece of video on YouTube showing the Hastings uh, lifeboat uh, self writing and uh, during Storm Kiara uh, a couple of years ago. I think that was 2017 or something. It's on YouTube somewhere. 
fantastic piece of video, and you can actually see her. Uh, you can see how she self writes, but they are in a, there are other YouTube videos showing tests of them, you know, turning one upside down in a harbour and seeing it come back up again. But they are all now all the all what they call the all weather lifeboats are all now self uprighting, yeah, and that was you. really that was really the the main lesson learned from uh, uh, this particular disaster. Thank you. What I think happened was it was a very very experienced crew, and well well versed in the conditions in that particular area and i think sometimes what happens is that a very ex a very experienced team of any kind whether they be lifeboatmen mountaineers or, or whatever they will uh, they will experience survive know how to deal with all sorts of extreme conditions one day they meet conditions a step more extreme than they've ever seen before and uh, i think that's what happened in that night yeah, just 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 tragic. Uh, but and I will find uh, that video that David talked about, uh, and I'll put it on our Facebook page this evening. Uh, there are also please... some videos of from Long Hope itself, where you you know maybe, uh, there's one with uh, Kevin Kirkpatrick and his daughter, and there's another one about the women, about the wives, the, the widows and how they kept the community together and things like that. There are all these various things on YouTube. If anybody's particularly interested, they can, they, they can find them quite easily with a YouTube search. Thanks, David. A, a question that I had in the back of my mind, and I was going to ask you uh, offline, uh, but Alec Krabs actually come in, and you're reading my mind, Alec. David, you're very knowledgeable. Are you a lifeboatman? I'm not a lifeboatman. I'm for, despite the fact I'm wearing a Stornoway life, I'm wearing a Stornoway lifeboat fleece. Uh, no, I, I, I'm not. A, I'm not tough enough to be a lifeboat. Uh, I'm not tough enough to be a lifeboat. In fact, uh, but I've always, I've always greatly admired the uh, the work of the RNLI. I used to work. I used to live in Oban, and I went to primary school in Oban, and I was always fascinated by the lifeboat there. And uh, I've always taken a great interest in the RNLI and the uh, life, lifeboat operations. So that's why I've kept up. I've kept up to date with that. There's also this excellent book, um, the Lifeboat Service in Scotland, station by station, and this is by uh, Nicholas Leach. That's uh, for anyone that's interested in modern lifeboat operations in Scotland. It's an absolutely brilliant book. Uh, <coughs> As Master Alan Burton uh, asks, uh, yes, Alan, please, please do unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, it sounds very, very strange, you know, when we're talking about 1970s, trying to build a self-writing boat. Mm -hmm. But it's not an easy subject because a boat, its centre of gravity, must be a third above its waterline. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you end up with a stiff boat. Mm -hmm. You get something that you can't actually work with at sea. Mm -hmm. So although it sounds very easy and very sensible to just make a self uh, writing lifeboat is a very, very complicated thing to do, yeah. which is why the technology has evolved quite uh, late. Yes. Uh, and my background to that is, uh, as a fireman, I studied ship stability. <laughs> yeah. So th thank you ever so much, David. An, an absolutely beautiful <coughs> presentation and ever so, ever so moving. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much, Alan. The uh, first, first self-writing lifeboat was created by America in 1944, mm -hmm. but it was never developed by this country. They, they didn't see the need of it because we had good boats, we had good boats at sea, uh, but never uh, achieving storms like you get every now and again at sea. I, I sailed on the coast for many years uh, with coastlines and the Pentland first was an absolute hatred at any time, even when it was a flat calm, because you didn't know what was going to happen next. And uh, um, and it was actually, I think, if I remember correctly, I was injured at sea on the on the uh, uh, Irish Sea, and uh, I think it was the Donagadee lifeboat that came out and took me off and took me back to the hospital in in Ireland. I think it was Donagadee. But I, it was a bit hazy that night. We had just lost a deck cargo of 17 gun barrels. And uh, that wasn't funny because we knew there was going to be an inquest. <laughs> so, um, 
but that was when the first one was 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 created in America, um, and I don't know the details of it, but uh, it was never developed uh, until well within the seventies. Yeah, yeah, and I sailed on a boat, a coaster, where you didn't get on unless you were in the Freemasons. <laughs> <laughs> because we visited lodges everywhere we went, and uh, and and uh, there was nine of us on board, and we were all Freemasons, and very regularly, when you were changing watches at two o'clock in the morning, they would give specific knocks on the wheelhouse door, the, the watch that was coming on, and you thought, here we go again, <laughs> and so you knew it was going to happen. Oh, Bob, thank you for that. Brilliant, a brilliant talk, an absolutely brilliant talk. Thank you very much. Thank thanks, you very, much. thanks very much. Bob, thank you for, for your uh, ditties, as the sailors say. Uh, but it's always good to have you here along this evening. Uh, Aubrey asks a question of you, David. How long have women been lifeboatmen? Or should that be lifeboat people nowadays? I suppose it should be. I don't know, is the answer. Uh, I that is something we'll try and find out for you as yes. well. And from our uh, immediate past master, Brother Secretary, and as we all know, uh, our sailor, uh, for those that go down to sea are always grateful for the RNLI and the brave men and women. And I think on that point from our Brother Secretary, Robert Clark, David, can I, on behalf of everyone here at the Lockdown Lecture Series of the Lodge Hope of Karachi, thank you, sir. Uh, for coming along this evening and giving us that very moving and poignant story uh, of human and Masonic tragedy. Thank you, sir. Thanks very much indeed, Gordon. I, agree. I really appreciate that. Well, uh, on that uh, very poignant uh, presentation, uh, we will continue over the next few weeks. Uh, we look forward to hearing the, the news that comes out from our heads of order, who I believe are meeting on the, the 12th of January to, to talk about the way forward. Uh, and no doubt we will uh, talk about that the following week at the Lockdown Lecture Series, what, what uh, our future holds. Uh, I am waiting to confirm the next two weeks' speakers. Uh, they are hopefully very interesting, as the rest have been over the, the last 96 weeks. Uh, and I hope to see you all next Tuesday. Uh, at 7pm London or Edinburgh time or Kinch time or Kelty time or Duns time or wherever <laughs> time you are, uh, Brian, uh, please come and join us. Uh, but if you can get back to your own meetings, please do that because that needs to be your priority, being back face to face with our Brian. Uh, Brian, please feel free to unmute. There's Vic Sutherland coming in. Late 60s, I believe, female started uh, as crew, and Ian Walker comment as well, did you not remember Grace Darling and what a story of her is that she was as well. So yeah. with that, yeah. Vern, please feel free to unmute and say your thank yous to Brother David Brown for... I would just like to say that this is the second time I've heard this as, as a member of the Devonshire Masters and Past Masters, and on the first time I heard it, I was on the verge of tears all the way through and the second time, it was exactly the same. A marvellous presentation. Thank, thank you very much, Alistair. Well done, David Brown. Yeah, absolutely, David. That was superb. Thank you, David. Well done, 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 David. Thanks very much, man. Excellent, David. Well done. Thank you, David. Thank you. A sad it's story to tell with great David, dignity and you. compassion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Brian. Well done, David. For Thanks very much. And very moonly put. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I'll give you five, Brian. Well done. Yep. Very good. Past Master David Brown. Can I just say apologies that I missed the first day five or ten minutes of it, I was jumping in and out of somebody else there, but I managed to catch it. David, thank you very much, and I hope you had a, a, a good New Year, David Brown. Thank oh, you. Oh, thanks very much, David, and I hope all's well with yourself and the family, Linda and the family as well. Thank you.
David, Thank my apologies you, for being late, but what I saw of your presentation <laughs> this evening was excellent, and I will catch up with it on the YouTube. Thank you very much for your right. thanks, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Robert. Nobody missed you, Nobby. <coughs> I never expected to be That's missed, right. Alistair. Oh, oh, oh. And, and three, brethren. And three. <laughs> Cutting as usual, much, Alistair. Uh, I'll thank wipe you, it out. An excellent thank you, presentation. Thank you very much. Well done, man. Very good. I'll, I'll wipe a tear from this glass eye. <laughs> <laughs> and two, thank you, Gordon. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, David. Thank you. And Gordon and all. Thank you. Take care, brother. Well done, Earl. Thanks very much. And finally, David, Thanks, Brian, Master, thank you so much for this moving tribute to those brave men and women of the Royal National Life Institution. And I'll just associate that comment to Brother Vic Sutherland, the Cox of the Broch Light Boat, who is still with us and has been with us this evening. And to you, Vic, and your crews, safe sailing and keep up the fantastic work. Thank you, sir. Hi, thank you very much, guys. Be a good UE up, and we'll maybe catch you again. Eh? Thank you very much. Thank you, Vic. Thank you. And then with that, a happy year to one and all.